Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts, to validate the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Jerry Bergman, has nine earned degrees, has taught biology, genetics, chemistry, anthropology, geology, and microbiology at the college level for over 40 years. He's authored over a thousand publications in 14 different languages, and a recent book that he has authored is the subject of our show today. Dr. Berkman, it's so good to have you back. Thank you. You're one of our most frequent and valued guests, so we're glad you're here. It's good to be back. Now, we're going to talk about the Darwin Effect. Uh, tell us what that is. Well, the original title of the book was Darwinism is the Universal Acid That Corrupts Everything. <laughs> Publisher said too long. Yeah. Amazon's not going to go for it, so they cut it back to the Darwin Effect. And basically what we do is we look at the effect, adverse effect of Darwinism on society as a whole. And what I'm hearing you say is that Darwin has had an enormous effect on our society and it's for, good, it's for evil and not for good. Incredible. And as I do more research on this, I'm realizing that he has an even greater effect than I thought just a few months ago. Yeah. Well, we're excited to uh, share with you. I don't know if excited is the right word because it's kind of bad news instead of good news, but I think it's things that our people need to learn. Yeah, we need to understand the effect that Darwinism had on society so we can counteract it. That's right, that's right. And when you ask, you know, go up here. When people ask relative to Darwin, who was the most evil man that ever lived? And people often say, well, Mao, Stalin, Hitler. Hitler's often number one. And so many candidates of the evil man that ever, most evil sure. man that ever lived. And... Uh, for my research, I've argued that, indeed, Darwinism, Darwin was the most evil man, not that he himself personally was evil, but his works, his ideas, which he publicized and managed to get throughout the world, ended up producing these Darwin, uh, producing Hitler, Mao, Stalin, and so on. And uh, I thought that conclusion would be controversial, but as I presented this in many venues, I found that it's not controversial at all. People understand the background between what Darwin did and the history, understand quite well that he did quite a bit. Uh, We're wrote, talking about the power of the pen here, aren't we? Those right. are men of the sword, but they were influenced by a man who wrote a little book. Exactly. We don't know that Darwin himself did anything really horribly evil. In fact, he was a good father, he was a good husband, he was... Uh, had a, a nice family and uh, did a good job raising his children, but his ideas, which he publicized widely throughout the world, had an enormous adverse effect, which is what I looked at. And uh, a few examples are, try to give you some history here. World War I was seven times greater than all wars in history put together. Now, this was a study done by, at Harvard University of the 902 major wars between 500 B.C. and A.D. 1918. Now, when you say it was greater, it wasn't longer, but in terms of destruction, is that destruction, what you're Destruction, property, and especially people. Yes. Enormously greater. Well, seven times greater. And we're talking about seven times greater than all the wars during this period enormous period. And then World War II was four times greater than World War I. And so when World War II, we're talking about then 28 times greater than all wars in history put together. Okay. And this World War II then, to recap, 28 times greater than all wars in history put together. And so in seven years, we're talking about deaths and destruction greater than 2,500 years. So we went from, to define evolution, and when we talk about the word evolution, a lot of people say, well, I, what are you talking about, genetic change or genetic variation? So I need to define evolution, how it's defined in the orthodox literature. And basically we're talking about from nothing to everything by chance, time, natural law, natural selection. In other words, survival of the fittest. So, and natural law, by the way, what we mean by that is, well, natural law, like gravity. In fact, some scientists have said gravity ultimately explains everything that exists in the world and the universe. But one would ask, how, how does gravity work? We know it works, we drop things, it always works, but no one really understands exactly what causes gravity to work. There are gravitons, there are theories and so on, but we don't really understand, as Einstein said, accent at a distance. 
And a short abbreviation for that, since this is a lot of words, I often use from the goo to you by way of the zoo. From the goo to you by way of the zoo. In other words, all life evolves by accumulation of billions of mistakes called mutations. That, in essence, is what evolution is. So that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about minor changes. We're not talking about breeding dogs from one type of dog, one wolf. We're talking about major changes that occurred, well, from hydrogen to everything by time, chance, natural selection, etc. Okay, genetic entropy. When in the medical field, and that's my primary focus in teaching is the medical field, we now know that about 99.9% .9 of all mutations are what they call near neutral or deleterious. Near neutral means that they're not by themselves damaging, but they accumulate. It's like in a car, one small thing goes wrong, the you know, speedometer doesn't work, and then the gas gauge doesn't work, and then tires are low, and the tires are bad. Eventually you end up with a car which doesn't run anymore. So when we're talking about near neutral mutations, each one is not a problem, but they add up. And, they're, and then, of course, we have the deleterious mutations. So we know when we look at evolution that it's going backwards. The evidence is very clear that we're not going uphill, we're going downhill. And that is what they call genetic entropy, which is an important concept, which is very now uh, talked about in the medical field because we have a, approximately 10,000 diseases we know that are caused primarily or which contribute to disease. So it's a major problem. Sounds more like devolution and evolution. Uh, yeah, it's, that's actually what we see going on. Right. So instead of evolving upward, we're evolving downward. downward. And studies, for example, you might wonder how we know this. Well, what they've done in many studies is they'll do an analysis of the genome of the parents, then they'll analyze the genome of the children, then they'll analyze the genome of the grandchildren, and they find on the average, roughly, each generation has between 50 and 100 new mutations. So what we see is, well documented in the literature now, we see genetic mutations are adding up, causing genetic entropy. So that is, that's evolution. Okay. Uh, and eventually, of course, we end up with what they call genetic meltdown. Genetic meltdown is essentially where an uh, individual dies, and of course we know that aging is caused by the accumulation of mutations causing death, and we know that genetic meltdown is when a species likewise ages and also ends up d dying and or becoming extinct is what we would say in the, the proper terminology. And so evolution is true, as we mentioned, but it's going the wrong way. So if people say, are you an evolutionist? I say, well, of course. Evolution is fact. It's going the wrong way. And that's well documented in the scientific literature. When I bring this up to colleagues, they say, well, yeah, but at one time it went up, now it's going down. But so, there's no evidence of that. There's, well, there's no evidence it's going up, but there's, no. of course, plenty of evidence it's right. going down. In fact, a recent article just came out in a science magazine which basically said, evolution is true, but now we're de-evolving. <laughs> and then it shows us from an ape-like stage and yeah. evolving up to modern man and then evolving now backwards, <laughs> downward, the other way, which I thought was uh, incongruous with what is taught. Okay, now how did evolution influence number of leaders? Well, this right here is Karl Marx, and he looked uh, very different as a young man than as an older man, yeah, well, of course, but we often see pictures of Marx when he was in his, what, 60s. So when I came across some pictures of him when he was younger, it's, he looks quite a bit different. And a central plank in Marx's doctrine was, quoting from a leading scholar of Marx, he was a committed Christian, which surprised me, until he encountered the materialistic ideas at the University of Berlin. And he was not only a committed Christian, some of his writings today would, would do well if they're republished and one would think when they read it, it was written by Billy Graham or some other Is that right? evangelical leader. It's very, very good writer, even in high school. In fact, he won several awards for his uh, commitment to the Christian worldview and his writing that he, that he did. Then he did a total flip. And he did a total flip. Yeah. And there is a more familiar picture yeah, of him. That's the one picture we're used to seeing, yeah. Right, and uh, this is a, 
proceeds down from Cuba, and of course now Cuba has been in the news a lot lately, and uh, a lot of concern about how do we deal with the communist government. Okay, his worldwide influence. Uh, Isaac Berlin, a Marx historian, claimed that no thinker, no thinker, pretty strong words here, has had so direct, deliberate, and powerful influence on mankind as had Karl Marx. And of course, the main influence he had was the development of communism, which eventually took over and dominated the Soviet Union, China, and many other countries, and of course, was a very important part of the Vietnam War, among other wars that we see uh, in history. And uh, the origin, the origin of the species by Charles Darwin, impressed Marx so much that one authority said, perhaps as deeply the origin as any book he read in his maturity. maturity when he was a young man. And so this had a profound influence on communism, and that's why communism is, has been anti-Christian, anti-theism since Karl Marx's uh, work and since his uh, writing. So one of the central things that turned Karl Marx from being a Christian uh, to a naturalist was uh, Darwin's work. Very, very important. He acknowledged that. In yeah. fact, quite a few, in fact, he wrote books on that, how important Darwinism was. Okay. And uh, that, therefore, uh, he, Darwin influenced his ideas from when he began developing communism. It also influenced the many other people who uh, followed his uh, works. And as we know, Marx is probably the most famous thing he's famous of saying is he openly denounced all religion as the opiate of the people. And when one thinks of Marx, almost invariably, this is one quote that comes up. Now, so it shows you how important he was. And nearly in every nation when communists took power, what happened? The churches were either abolished or neutralized. Very, very important uh, result. And of course, resulted in a huge number of deaths in communist countries. Invariably, they uh, seen the Second or third step, they want to eliminate the Christians, either legally or illegally. And before becoming a Darwinist, Marx, Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Tung, all accepted Christian teachings that humans were all brothers and all descendants of Adam and Eve. And of course, after they rejected Genesis and Christianity, they no longer accepted this. And then they had the philosophy that we need to get rid of those, we need to eliminate those who are opposing our changes in our in society and if you think about it if they continued to embrace Christian creationism they would not have become leaders of anti-Christian totalitarian movements so Darwin indeed changed history drastically because of the movement of these people from a Christian worldview to a Darwinian worldview and Frederick Engels, Marx's co-worker, same thing, raised by strict Bible-believing father and left his uh, beliefs as a child, and uh, he read German theologians, and eventually he also became a major contributor, financially especially, to the Darwinian Revolution and communism itself. Okay, what was the result of this? These statistics vary. Obviously, one you know, depends on the scholar, but try to find, indeed, what was the effect of these uh, changes in society. And the Oxford World Christian Encyclopedia did a lot of research on this, and they concluded that 45.5 million Christian martyrs were in the last century alone. Wow. In all of history, 77 million Christian martyrs have existed. So we're talking about almost as many during one century as occurred throughout all of 2,000 years. You know, we always think of the Christians being fed to the lions and so forth, but really it was the last, it was the 20th century where the most Christians died. That's amazing. Yeah, by far. And it wasn't just a slight increase, it was oh. horrendously greater. And all of this, or much of this, can be attributed to the communist movement eventually going back to Charles Darwin. And now Lenin, of course, the same thing. He was influenced by Darwinism, raised by devout Bible believing parents. And once he embraced uh, Darwinism, he basically then discovered Marx's writings as well and became, of course, the infamous Lenin. And the same thing with uh, others. In fact, Lenin was fascinated with the ideas of Charles Darwin. In fact, it's said that Darwinism soon became his new religion, uh, Lenin's religion. 
And Stalin, Stalin, the same thing. In fact, Stalin was a seminary student. And then when he discovered Darwin, he basically uh, talked to one of his friends and said, you know, I've been reading this book called The Origin of Species, and this book has changed my life. Convinced there was no longer a God, there was no longer a need for Christianity. In fact, Christianity got in the way of what he wanted to do. And what he wanted to do, of course, was to convert the Soviet Union and the world eventually to communism. And here again is a picture of Stalin as a young man, which is uh, not the picture we normally see when we uh, think about Stalin. And to give you some ideas of the effect of uh, Soviet rule, the war fatalities, about 16 million, a collectivization of agriculture, forcing the communist system on the people, about 22 million people died. Purges, these were opposition, Christians, heavily, about 19 million. Camp deaths, about 15 million. Executions after the war. After the war, World War II was over, they ended up executing a huge number of people and World War I. And 9 million is the number I have here. Total about 81 million people. And this is a conclusion of a number of leading scholars who look very carefully at this. And again, these are estimates. It may be 83 million, it may be 79 million, but... It's a lot of people. We're not talking about a small number of people, right. We're talking about a, a huge, huge number of people. Okay, the source of the idea. Why was Darwin so important? Well, one of the things Darwin wanted to do was murder God. How do you murder God? You murder God by basically eliminating the reason people believe in God. Why do people believe in God? Well, because creation requires a creator. And as a result, how do you eliminate the belief that people believe in God? The reason. Well, you come up with a creator aside from a creator, and that was his idea of evolution. Darwinism or evolution. His own words were, it's like committing a murder. <laughs> and indeed, that's what he was trying to do. Darwinism, we know today, is the engine that drives atheism. And when I was involved in the atheist movement, I noticed that they talked more about evolution than they talked about atheism in some journals. And this was because they realized the engine that drives evolution, they get recruits by convincing the population of the validity of Darwinism, and thus people are driven away from Christianity and towards uh, Darwinism and towards atheism, eventually the goal. Dawkins, probably one of the most famous evolutionists today, he said evolution allows one to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And this is why atheists push evolution because they know how important Darwinism is for atheism. And when we look at the top scientists on surveys, and they found about 98% of leading scientists, not the average, but leading scientists, about 98% were atheists.